The hearing will come to order. Good morning and welcome to the Labor, Health and Human Services and Education Appropriations Subcommittee. Today's hearing is on the nation's ongoing response to the coronavirus. Like all other efforts on the supplemental package, it has been bipartisan. Let me commend my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, including my friend and ranking member, Congressman Tom Cole. Before I begin, I want to extend a very warm welcome to our witnesses. Dr. Tom Frieden, President and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives and former Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, from 2009 through 2016. And Dr. Caitlin Rivers, Senior Scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security and Assistant Professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Frieden, in his testimony, will provide a perspective based on 30 years of fighting epidemics, including leading the CDC's response to Ebola, of where we are and what we need to do to protect Americans. Dr. Rivers makes the case why, in the months and years to come, will we need additional capacities in diagnostic testing, contact tracing, and the health systems to combat the virus. I'm also so glad to have my colleagues here. I want to thank them for being here this morning. On the Democratic side, Congresswoman Catherine Clark, Sherry Bustos, Bonnie Watson Coleman. And on the Republican side, Congressman Tom Cole, uh, Congressman Andy Harris, and I hope we will have Congresswoman Jamie uh, Herrera Butler. We are all disappointed that others could not be here because of distance, reduced flights, and the health issues raised by the House physician. Chairwoman Nita Lowy, Ranking Member Kay Granger, Congresswoman Lucille Roybal Allard, Barbara Lee, Lois Frankel, and Congressman, Congressman Mark Pocan, John Molinar, and Tom Graves. They could not attend, but they did send questions, which we will ask on their behalf. But I want to underscore uh, that members should not be blocked from participating in the committee's hearings. All committee members should be heard, and that requires moving as quickly as possible into the 21st century and conduct virtual hearings. Every member should be able to participate. I am angry that the White House mismanaged America's reaction to the pandemic, and the President has done everything he could to avoid accountability. I'm particularly upset about the lack of the necessary testing and the personal protective equipment capacity, both of which could help us to gain control. And then yesterday, President Donald Trump told reporters that he would not permit Dr. Anthony Fauci to testify before the Democratic House Committee because, and I quote, the House is a bunch of Trump haters. Quote, they frankly want our situation to be unsuccessful. But they are allowing Dr. Fauci to testify before the U.S. Senate next week. This is a bipartisan panel. Dr. Fauci has appeared before our subcommittee dozens of times. He has testified whether it was a Democratic or a Republican chair. He has testified hundreds of times on Capitol Hill working with Democratic and Republican presidents. Yet now, the White House said no, leaving no doubt it is just frightened of oversight. The Labor HHS subcommittee provided billions of dollars of funding for the CDC, the NIH, the National Strategic Stockpile, hospitals, and BARDA. We have appropriated $175 billion for hospitals and other health care providers. Most recently, $25 billion to expand testing and improve diagnostics, including $11 billion for state and locality testing capacity. The purpose of today's hearing is to get a clear-eyed view of the path forward for responding to COVID-19. In the near term, uh, as we work to mitigate the spread of the coronavirus, in the medium term, as we develop the therapeutics to treat the disease and a vaccine to inoculate millions of Americans against the coronavirus. And in the long term, as we make investments to enhance our nation's public health and global health systems to better prepare for the next pandemic over the horizon. These are the three pillars we will look to build. 
In today's hearing, I would like to explore the recommendations of our two public health experts on the necessary measures that must be put in place and the benchmarks that must be met to move forward while keeping Americans safe. Science and facts must drive our policy, and that demands hearing from doctors, scientists, researchers, and experts who command those facts and drive science to public policy. It is urgent that we do so. Disease modelers predicted, according to the New York Times and the Washington Post, that in the coming months, 3,000 Americans could die every day. There is no time to delay. Our witnesses today will give us the analysis, the facts, the science, and the strategy that will help us to make the right decisions. With that, I would like to recognize my good friend, the ranking member of the committee, for any opening remarks that he would like to make. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, let me make a few extemporaneous remarks uh, before I get to my prepared remarks. First, I just want to really thank you for holding this hearing. Uh, I think it's a very important hearing to, to have, and uh, I want to thank all my colleagues that were able to make the trip here. We all understand why others couldn't, but uh, I really appreciate each of you on both sides of the aisle for, for coming. Um, and I want the record to show I joined uh, the chairman in urging that uh, Dr. Fauci be allowed to testify here. I think it would have been uh, good testimony, useful to this committee, I think useful to this country. Uh, frankly, I think going forward, this subcommittee probably more than any other is going to need administration input, expert input, as we uh, make the important uh, decisions in front of us. And while I'm not naive enough to believe that there's not a certain amount of partisanship on uh, Capitol Hill and some committees are more partisan than others, frankly, the Appropriations Committee in general and particularly this subcommittee are not hyper-partisan committees in my view, and the record shows it. Uh, in the last five years, working together on this subcommittee and with our friends in the United States Senate, uh, particularly Senator Blunt and Senator Murray, um, you know, we've increased NIH funding by 39 percent. We've increased CDC funding by 24 percent. We've increased uh, the strategic stockpile funding by 34 percent. We've established the Infectious Disease Rapid Response Fund. Uh, I think that's a bipartisan record of accomplishment to be proud of, and I don't uh, I think in retrospect, we would all wish we had done more, but the reality is we are so much better off where we're at because of the actions taken in a bipartisan sense uh, by this committee. So its record um, shows that it knows how to work together. I just note for the record, my friend, the chairman, uh, when I was chairman, I voted for final passage of the bill every single time. We negotiated, uh, got to a place where we could agree, and she helped me get it across. I was able to do the same thing with her when she was last year assumed the uh, chairmanship, and I hope that's the way we can continue uh, to work uh, going forward. So again, I think uh, we're going to be called upon to make some really important uh, decisions. And uh, having read the testimony, both Dr. Rivers and Dr. Frieden, um, you know, a lot of that is going to call for sustained investment in the public health sector. Frankly, I think it's going to call for us looking at uh, uh, the CAPS agreements on some of these accounts as well. I don't think you can probably get to where we need to go within the CAPS. So we need the the input, which I know our two witnesses here today will, uh, will give us. And uh, again, I look forward to working with every member of this committee, and particularly with you, Madam Chair, uh, to, to arrive at the right decisions for all our country uh, going forward. So with that, again, I want to thank you, too, for the many calls and briefings that you've held over the past few weeks to keep all of us updated on efforts to overcome this pandemic. Over the last several weeks, the spread of COVID-19 has caused unthinkable disruptions to life as usual, and it will continue to do so for some time, even as we flatten the curve. Following the unprecedented uh, strain on our health care systems and the devastating economic hits to hardworking Americans as a direct result of this uh, coronavirus, the desire for normalcy to return is certainly a sentiment shared by us all. But as state and local economies slowly and cautiously begin to reopen, it's important to remember that getting back to business does not yet mean getting back to normal. Even though the fight against COVID-19 is far from over, Keeping businesses closed and workers at home is not a sustainable option for the long term. While the federal government has provided some short-term relief to help individuals, households, businesses, and communities stay afloat during this period of extreme social distancing, our economies need to get uh, moving again and Americans need to get back to work. 
However, any such efforts to reopen must continue to keep the health and safety of Americans at the top of mind and not undo previous progress in slowing the spread of coronavirus. Uh, this will indeed be a balancing act. Uh, until there are working treatments, effective therapeutics, and ultimately a vaccine to control COVID-19, the risk and the danger for disease remains. Uh, returning to more regular functions and operations requires gradual action completed in phases and based on data. President Trump and the Coronavirus Task Force recently recommended criteria for states and communities to achieve before moving into phases of reopening. This includes a consistent downward trend in reported symptoms, consistent downward trend in documented cases, or positive tests, as well as hospitals being able to treat all patients without crisis care and robust testing in place for all at-risk health care workers. While this is a, a helpful reopening blueprint, states are not strictly bound to it. Indeed, uh, just as there are 50 separate and unique states, there may be, well, 50 different approaches to reopening uh, that carry the same spirit of caution and decision-making based on sound data. However, the idea behind these three phases is to gradually allow businesses and workplaces to open back up, but not immediately at full speed ahead or without adaptations to prevent crowded environments. In the earliest phases, this may include limiting the number of employees inside of uh, workplaces, continuing telework practices, uh, vulnerable and other uh, older Americans remaining at home or limiting the number of customers inside retail stores and restaurants. Clearly, life is going to be different going forward for a while than it was in our immediate past. Regardless of the uh, phase of reopening in our communities, we must remember not to abandon practical and hygienic precautions like thoroughly and frequently washing hands, not touching our faces, daily disinfecting of surfaces, keeping a safe distance from others, and staying at home when you're sick. Finally, it's critically important that the federal government learns from this crisis and actively prepares to face down another pandemic in the future. While I'm proud that Congress has generously invested in worthy tools and response resources to strengthen our readiness in recent years, it must be an even higher priority in the days to come. Though the United States uh, was uh, as prepared as any country to face the emergency, you can never be fully prepared for what you don't know is coming. In this case, a mysterious and deadly virus originating in China, only identified early this year, and for which a vaccine does not yet exist. I look forward to hearing uh, more recommendations from our witness, Madam Chair, this morning, and I yield back the balance of my time. Let me say thank you to the ranking member and assure you that we will continue as a subcommittee uh, to work uh, together in a collaborative spirit to do what's right in this area and, um, uh, and other areas that we have jurisdiction over on behalf of the American people. And let me also welcome our colleague, Congresswoman uh, Jamie Herrera Butler. You've come a long way uh, from a state that has really been hard hit um, by the coronavirus. So thank you so much uh, uh, for, for being here, really appreciate that. And, and now I would like to introduce uh, our witnesses, our first witnesses. Witness is Dr. Tom Frieden. Dr. Frieden is president and CEO of Resolve to Save Lives, a global initiative and part of the global public health organization, Vital Strategies. Dr. Frieden was director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, from 2009 through 2016. Dr. Frieden is recognized as one of the world's leading experts. His current organization is assisting more than 60 countries during this COVID-19 epidemic, as well as providing technical assistance to New York State and other jurisdictions here at home. During his time at CDC, many will recall that he led the response to the Ebola outbreak, along with his colleagues at the State Department. He also spearheaded many new health initiatives here in the U.S., including initiatives to address the opioid epidemic and to reduce chronic disease. Dr. Frieden, we are so pleased to have you here today. Your full written test statement will be entered into the record, um, and um, you are now recognized for your opening remarks. Thank you very much, and good morning. Uh, microphone. Thank you very much, and good morning. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, distinguished members of the subcommittee, I appreciate the opportunity to testify. Uh, in the next few minutes, as you say, I'll provide a perspective based on three decades of fighting infectious diseases in the U.S. and globally. 
the bottom line is that COVID is a terrible tragedy. Families have experienced devastating loss. Parents have lost their jobs and all of our lives have been disrupted. Our war against COVID will be long and difficult and we must act strategically now and establish a new way of preventing future health disasters. At an appropriate time, we can assess what went well and what didn't. I'm acutely aware that hindsight is 2020. It's far too easy to second guess decisions that others have made. We're just at the beginning of this pandemic and must focus on the future. There is only one enemy here, a dangerous microbe. It's us against them, humans against the virus. We'll get through this best if we work together, learn from each other, and support each other. Here are 10 plain truths about COVID-19. First, it's really bad. In New York City, where I live, I've heard for the past two months the sounds of ambulances day and night. In New York City, it's on the order of the 1918-1919 pandemic. More than 20,000 people, when you look at all of the excess deaths in the last two months, killed in less than two months. That is as bad as the worst phase of the pandemic 100 years ago. Even now, with deaths decreasing substantially, there are twice as many deaths from COVID in New York City as there are on a usual day from all other causes combined. And sadly, looking at the US as a whole, just calculating forward from the number of people whose infections have already been documented, there will be tragically at least 100,000 deaths from COVID by the end of this month. Second, as bad as this has been, it's just the beginning. Until we have an effective vaccine and unless something very unexpected happens, our viral enemy will be with us for many months and possibly many years. Third, data is a very powerful weapon against this virus. Real-time monitoring of trends, finding cases before they become clusters, clusters before they become outbreaks, outbreaks before they become explosive epidemics that risk the lives of healthcare workers and others. Fourth, we'll be able to reopen as soon and safely as possible by basing decisions on data and creating together a new normal. We're all so impatient to restart our activities. Sheltering in place is a blunt but effective weapon. It suppresses spread of the virus, but inflicts severe economic hardship on individuals and the economy. We need to deploy all of the effective weapons in our arsenal. After flattening the curve, the next step is what we call the box it in strategy. There are four corners to each of the box it in aspects. Testing widely and strategically, isolating people who test positive, using contact tracing to confidentially warn people who are exposed to the virus and quarantining contacts, providing essential services so that they can be sure that infection stops with them. If any corner of that box is weak, the virus can escape and spread explosively again. Each of the four is important. Fifth, find the balance between restarting our economy and letting the virus run rampant. We're conditioned to think in terms of dichotomies, A versus B. But in this case, open versus closed is not a dichotomy. It's more accurate to think of a dimmer switch or a dimmer dial than an on-off switch with gradations to avoid undue risk. Even when we're closed, many essential activities continue. And when we reopen, our new normal will be different. With care and creativity, we can open sooner and safer. Our new normal will change the way we travel, work, learn, and go about our lives. The virus can create a new generation in minutes, but in human populations, it takes weeks to see the result of re uh, repeated spread. So if as we reopen, there's a lot of spread, it will take weeks before we actually see it. Another false dichotomy is be between public health and economic security. In fact, the very best way to get our economy back is to control the virus and economic stability is critically important to the public's health. Sixth, we must protect the healthcare workers and other essential staff who are the frontline heroes of this war. They should never have to put their lives at risk to care for us. Having safer healthcare facilities is essential to enabling more 
societal activity to resume. It's one thing to take risks for yourself, but if the risk that you take for yourself ends up infecting a nurse or doctor and then their mother or father or child, that's something quite different. Seventh, we have to protect our most vulnerable people. Unless we take urgent action, there will be at least 100,000 deaths in nursing homes throughout this country. All congregate facilities and high-risk high settings require intensive protection. We must also act now to reduce the higher rates of both infection and death among African American, Native American, and Hispanic people. Eighth, governments and private companies must join forces to make massive continued investments in testing and distributing a vaccine as soon as possible, ensuring rapid and equitable access in this country and around the world. Nothing else will enable life to get back to a pre-COVID normalcy. Treatments can help and should be available sooner, but are unlikely to be the kind of game changer that a safe and effective vaccine would be. Ninth, we must heighten, not neglect, our focus on non-COVID health issues. This is a very important lesson from around the world. Not only do underlying conditions increase the risk of severe illness from COVID, but if we don't continue non-COVID conditions, there will be many deaths that could have been avoided, not from people infected with COVID, but from people affected by the disruption in services that COVID causes. And when fall comes around, we'll need to do the best we've ever done at getting people vaccinated against influenza, because that will make our job easier in the next phase. Tenth, never again. It is inevitable that there will be future outbreaks. It's not inevitable that we will continue to be so underprepared. This is an interconnected world. A disease risk anywhere is a disease risk everywhere. And when the world is safer, we will be safer. It was very difficult, as you all know, to secure funding for global health security. It took years of effort, and funding was only allocated after the Ebola epidemic hit, and that only one-time funding. Therefore, Congress and the administration deserve congratulations for quickly passing comprehensive bipartisan legislation for supplemental funding for the COVID response. But supplemental funding is a temporary fix. It's a Band-Aid. Without sustained support, our health will be avoidably at risk. One-time funds are very problematic. From the point of view of someone, someone running an agency, you can't hire the best staff. You can't enter into partnerships with countries and organizations where you can keep up your end of the bargain. And you can't hold contractors accountable for an ongoing contract. You in Congress have a unique opportunity to take strategic action and protect Americans from another microbial sneak attack. To protect us from health threats, we have to change the way we allocate funds. We've all been through this. Discretionary funding is subject to caps and sequestration. Even mandatory funding doesn't ensure stable support, as we've seen. We propose a new approach for specific public health programs. These are programs particularly to prevent, detect, and respond to health threats, and we suggest calling this the Health Defense Operations, or HDO, budget designation. It would exempt only these critical health protection funds from Budget Control Act caps, so our public health agencies can protect us. HDO programs should be required to submit a bypass professional judgment directly to Congress annually, just as the NIH does for HIV, Alzheimer's, and cancer. That way, Congress and the American people can understand what's really needed for our public health defense, and Congress can appropriate the resources required to sustain the public health system we need to keep us safe. This investment can save millions of lives and potentially, as we've seen, trillions of dollars. Good public health is good business. In my 30 years in global public health, I've never seen anything like this. It's scary. It's unprecedented. We're learning more each day. I've outlined some of the things that we can do at home, in business, in government, right now, to slow the spread of COVID and rebuild our economy. We must make sure this never happens again by investing in systems to find and stop emerging health threats before they spread, whenever and wherever that's possible. Thank you, and I look forward to answering your questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Friedman, and appreciative. I think so personally about this, uh, this issue. Um, I never knew him, but my grandfather died in the Spanish influenza in 1918 at age 
36, leaving a widow and five children and one on the way. And um, so it is, um, it really brings it all home that we could be now experiencing this and our families could be experiencing all of this. Now I'd like to introduce our second witness, Dr. Caitlin Rivers. Dr. Rivers is a senior scholar at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security, as well as assistant professor in the Department of Environmental Health and Engineering at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Dr. Rivers has been a leading public health voice during the response to COVID-19. She co-authored a report along with Dr. Scott Gottlieb and their colleagues at the American Enterprise Institute, AEI, a roadmap to reopening which outlines a series of milestones and capabilities that states should meet as they consider easing restrictions on businesses and social life. Dr. Rivers is also the lead author of a report, Public Health Principles for a Phased Reopening During COVID-19, Guidance for Governors, which is being used by the National Governors Association, as well as Maryland and Washington, D.C., to guide their reopening plans. I would also note that Dr. Rivers worked as an epidemiologist for the United States Army Public Health Center as a Department of Defense smart scholar. Dr. Rivers, we are so pleased to have you with us here today. Again, your full written statement will be entered into the record. You will now are recognized for your opening remarks. Thank you. Chairwoman DeLauro, Ranking Member Cole, and distinguished members of the committee, thank you for the chance to speak with you today about the COVID-19 response. As Chairwoman DeLauro described, I'm an epidemiologist at the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security at the Bloomberg, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I've co-authored a number of reports and guidance documents on reopening safely, and it's lessons from that work that I want to share with you today. But first, a little bit about the, co the current situation. The United States still faces 25 to 30,000 new cases every day and approximately 2,000 deaths, a range that held steady for the entire month of April. Many states are either moving towards reopening or looking ahead to those decisions and wondering, as we all are, how to do that safely. It's clear to me that we are in a critical moment of this fight. We risk complacency in accepting the preventable deaths of 2,000 Americans each day. We risk complacency in accepting that our healthcare workers do not have what they need to do their jobs safely. And we risk complacency in recognizing that without continued vigilance, we will again create the conditions that led to us being the worst affected country in the world. And so with that in mind, I want to highlight a few critical capacities that I think we should be prioritizing. The first critical capacity is diagnostic testing. Last week, we performed about 1.6 million tests, which is a big improvement over March and even over early April when we performed about 1 million tests per week. These gains are a testament to the impressive biomedical enterprise that we have built through sustained investment in science and medicine. But estimates of the number of tests that we will need to gain control of this outbreak start at 3.5 million per week and go up from there. We urgently need a national plan for how we will close that gap. We need to understand what national capacities we can expect at the end of May, at the end of June, at the end of August. Where are the bottlenecks? Where are the untapped resources? And it's not just for the test kits. It's also for all of the consumable supplies that are required for testing the swabs, the PPE for the care providers, the viral transport media, there are a lot of components involved in diagnostic testing. And at various points, all of those have been implicated in intermittent shortages. And we urgently need to understand where we are going with diagnostic testing and how we are going to get there. If this work has been done, I have not seen it, and I fear that neither have the governors and the mayors and the business leaders and the university presidents and the school principals all of whom are having to make decisions about how and when to reopen. So it's not just the federal government that needs this information, it's really all of us who are trying to navigate how we will get from where we are to where we want to be. The second capacity is contact tracing. You heard from Dr. Frieden that contact tracing is really a key component, a key approach that will allow us to reopen safely. One thing that I don't hear a lot about about contact tracing though that I want to bring to your attention is that it's also a key source of data that we badly need. We currently have very little understanding about where people are getting infected. Our most new cases in long-term care facilities or correctional facilities, which we know are high-risk settings, but we don't have a good sense of whether 99% of our cases originate in those special settings or whether it's a small fraction. 
We don't know whether people who are essential workers still performing duties in the community are getting infected, or we don't know whether most infections are happening at home. Getting a better understanding of what that looks like will help us to guide better interventions. If it is special settings, we know we need to be doing more to protect people there, but we might also assess the risk to the general community to be lower. On the other hand, if most people are getting infected at home, that points for a need for some sort of central isolation capacity, by which I mean if people feel that they would be safer recovering in a hotel away from their families, for example, that should be an, op an option that should be made available to them. But we would want to know what fraction of cases are originating in the household to understand whether that is an important investment. This information on where transmission is occurring is of critical importance, but it's not currently being prioritized. And it is contact tracing that allows us to collect this data. So in addition to being a key tool for containment, it's also a key tool for helping us to guide our response and the decisions that we need for that. The third pillar is healthcare capacity. We were able to secure enough healthcare capacity to treat everyone with COVID only through extraordinary measures like canceling elective procedures and turning operating rooms into ICUs. But right as we start to think about unwinding some of those decisions is when states are moving to reopen. And so we need to be exquisitely careful in this period that we do not allow our healthcare systems to become overwhelmed by drawing down our surge capacity as we increase time spent in the community. We need to be careful that we do not again create the conditions of New York or Lombardy or Wuhan. We should plan now for how we will staff and fund deployable medical teams to move from hotspot to hotspot. And I'll point out too that we are making these decisions as we face hurricane season, which will draw on many of the same resources. And so I think we need to be plan for the worst case scenario and understand that we, we may be needing these surge capacity resources in the coming months. And we should also continue to fight for sufficient supplies for personal protective equipment to keep our healthcare workers safe. This has been a continuous problem and it's one we need to solve permanently. It's not acceptable that our healthcare workers don't have what they need to do their job safely. So these three capacities, testing, contact tracing, and healthcare will enable us to transition safely from staying at home to slow the spread into a gradual reopening. We should be working now to ensure that we have the tools to do that successfully. I now want to touch briefly on a longer term priority that I think we should keep in our sights. We've seen on the White House task force briefings and on the nightly news that infectious disease modeling or outbreak science is playing an important role in guiding the COVID-19 response. And it's not just COVID, this was also an important capacity during 2014 Ebola, during H1N1, and it will certainly be an important resource in the future pandemics that we can be confident we will face. But what many people don't realize is that the expertise to produce those models is not a standing national capacity. It's mostly a volunteer force of academics who produce those models. This approach stands in stark contrast to weather forecasting, which the nation has invested in for decades through the National Weather Service. We don't have anything like that for outbreaks, but this pandemic underscores why that must change. We should consider establishing a national center that would perform epidemic forecasting and analytics. And just briefly, one other longer term priority that I think we should be considering, or opportunity rather, is that we put enormous resources into developing medical countermeasures for threats that we have previously identified. But we don't have dedicated programs for what we call disease X, or these new pathogens that we didn't know existed until suddenly they are an enormous threat. And so I think we should be thinking about how we could stand up programs and fund resources to develop the tools we need to expand our capacities and raise the bar of readiness for those pathogens that we don't know anything about, but that we could be facing at any point. So in conclusion, thanks to the leadership of the House Appropriations Committee, the country has made important progress towards combating this pandemic. We must prioritize the strengthening of capacities in diagnostic testing, contact tracing, and the health system so we can successfully combat the virus in the weeks, months, and years to come. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Rivers. At some point, I would love to talk to you about your idea on a uh, a, uh, a, a center akin to the National Weather, Weather Service. It, it's, uh, I'll try to find out more about it. I'm gonna, uh, <clears throat> as in the past, we will proceed to five minute rounds, uh, alternating back and forth by seniority as members were seated at the beginning of today's hearing. Um, we're gonna be respectful of our witnesses and trying to give them enough time to respond uh, to, uh, to, to questions. Uh, I will move forward. 
Um, Dr. Frieden and Dr. Rivers, both of you have provided recommendations about the type of state and local capacity that needs to be in place before scaling back limitations on economic uh, or social activity. According to reports, disease modelers are projecting the country is moving in exactly the opposite direction. According to a range of projections, new daily cases of COVID-19 could surge this month, and some are projecting that deaths could rise to 3,000 each day. And I would just like to ask a series of, of, of questions of, of, of each of you. To the best of your knowledge, is there a single state that has met the necessary parameters to ease restrictions? We suggest in our AEI report that you mentioned at the beginning of the session that there are four criteria that states should meet mm -hmm. in order to safely reopen. And not all states have adopted these criteria, but I'll review them just as a starting point. Mm -hmm. The first is to see the number of new cases decline for at least two weeks. And some states have met that criteria, but there are three other criteria and they, we suggest they should all be met. Mm -hmm. The other is enough public health capacity to conduct contact tracing on all new cases enough diagnostic testing to test everybody with COVID-like symptoms, not just those people with severe illness, and enough healthcare system capacity to treat everyone safely. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, there are no states that meet all four of those criteria. Dr. Frieden, is there any single state that meets the criteria laid out? I have not looked at all of the data from all states, but I would make two comments. One, there may be areas within states that are closer than others to meeting that, and second, as I said in my opening testimony, open versus closed is it's not a strict on-off switch. Mm -hmm. There are things that are always open, essential services, essential retail hospitals, emergency facilities, mm -hmm. and there are things that might be first to open. Out of doors is way less risky than inside. Lower risk businesses, takeout from restaurants, outdoor recreation, uh, even daycare, if done very carefully and safely, may be lower risk. So I think we need to think of this as a, as a dimmer rather than an on-off. On-off switch. Just a, 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 a quick follow-up here, and then I, uh, I want to get to uh, you know, a couple of other uh, items. Uh, any state testing 1% of its population every week? Just no. No? Okay. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> um, any state or region been able to reduce the basic reproductive uh, number below one, meaning that the epidemic is no longer growing? There is some evidence that some states have. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> Dr. Rivers, you, you're the lead author of a report where you're making recommendations uh, to the governors. Um, <clears throat> to be clear, reopening will increase the risk of COVID-19 spread. Therefore, it is important for leaders to know that getting things open again will increase the risks of individuals contracting COVID-19, and there is no way to completely guard against that. Let me ask this of both of you. Should the country be reopening now? Are we ready? Is it irresponsible to open the economy without adequate testing? I think there is an enormous need to balance public health with the economic pressures, and so I think that's what we see factoring into decisions. I think as, even as we move towards reopening and as some states make that decision, we still need to be focusing on increasing our capacities to do diagnostic testing and to do contact tracing. Mm -hmm. The time, the window we have to implement those interventions is still open, and so I don't think it's either or. I would say that we need to continue to rapidly ramp up our ability to do all of the four things I mentioned, not just test, but also isolate people who are infected, contact trace, and quarantine. By having all of those things in place, we can come out safer and sooner and restart our economy without a risk of explosive spread. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was, uh, I, I know it was, it was uh, Dr. Fauci who the last several days who said, how many deaths and how much suffering are we willing to accept uh, if you want to get back to some sense of normalcy? Um, what is your sense of what is acceptable in terms of uh, deaths or suffering to be able to get back to normalcy if we don't have the public health, um, uh, public health professionals advising us? I think we need to continue to prioritize public health. We have seen that several other countries have regained control of their outbreaks, South Korea, Singapore, Australia. We can do that too. It's going to be difficult and it's going to take a lot of investment in our communities, 
but th that op option remains open to us. I would just add we have to ensure that we protect our healthcare workers and other essential workers. They are not making a choice. They are doing their duty in protecting and providing essential services, and we have to do everything possible to keep them safe. And we have to pay particular attention to the most vulnerable, such as our nursing homes, large congregate facilities, homeless shelters, um, correctional facilities, large factories where many people are working together, where we can see explosive spread that can not only uh, cause a lot of suffering and death, but also seed infections to elsewhere in the community. Just quickly, it's, it's, the, the issue is, is that what the, the, the criteria is? How many deaths and suffering are we willing to accept in your view? I think this is a balance. Uh, we need to reopen so we can restart important medical care. We need to reopen for our economy, but we need to do that in a way that is careful and doesn't risk an explosion of cases that sends us back into our homes. Okay. Thank you. I yield now to my colleague, Congressman McCall. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank both of you for your excellent testimony and again for the papers you submitted. Dr. Frieden, let me start with you. I'm very intrigued uh, by the idea you've presented uh, about a special health defense budget, sort of the equivalent of what in defense we'd call OCO spending. That is something outside the caps. We just recognize we're at war. We spend what it takes to win the war, uh, regardless of whatever budget mechanisms. And I think this is, you know, you and I have had this discussion, the chairman and I have had this discussion about uh, particular accounts that need perhaps to be exempted. Uh, could you go through in a little bit more detail and talk to us about what specific accounts, in your view, we would need to sort of set outside the normal budget process and say when it comes to public health and threats that emerge, we're going to have to be free to spend what we need in these areas. Thank you very much. And uh, I appreciate uh, all of your commitment to this issue over the years. We've discussed it for many years. And what we've seen is if it's indiscretionary, no matter how well-intentioned everyone is, there are going to be problems. If it's in mandatory, no matter how fixed we think it is, it isn't. So what we've suggested is something similar to the overseas contingency um, uh, uh, account that allows for um, a professional judgment of what's needed. And if we can enter into the record uh, a letter sent to um, both Senate and House leaders uh, yesterday and signed by uh, former Senate majority leaders da uh, Frist and Daschle, as well as myself, and multiple other former CDC directors, Bill Fagey, David Satcher, Jeff Sager. Madam Sager. Chair, I'd ask that we could enter that letter, if we may, to the yes. record. And that it also includes uh, budget line examples of which would be included. Um, they're squarely in the area of protecting Americans. Uh, we wouldn't want to choose between our uh, military radar defense and another part of the budget. In the same way, we shouldn't have to choose between this kind of defense and another part of our budget. Uh, uh, Mr. Cole, you've said over the years that Americans are far more likely to be killed by a pandemic than by a terrorist attack, and I'm afraid uh, the past month has shown that to be quite prescient. Um, in the same way, I think we have to recognize uh, that there, other than nuclear war, there's nothing else that can kill 10 million people around the world except a biological event. And we have to do everything in our power to prevent that from happening. So the approach is essentially twofold. One, you identify the budget lines, you make them off budget through this HDO or some other mechanism similar to the OCO account. And second, tightly related to that, you require a bypass professional judgment. Do not stop at go, do not get cut 200 by OMB, give the actual professional judgment from what's needed so that in Congress and in public you can assess that and then put in all of the accountability metrics for what we expect to see for the monies that are being spent. This is not a piggy bank. This is a specific investment in building up our national defense. Madam Chair, I'd suggest that's something we need to work on together and maybe submit together for the consideration of our colleagues uh, uh, because it will take, you know, obviously uh, agreement between the House, the Senate, and the executive branch, but I think it's a very good idea. Uh, Dr. Rivers, let me turn to you, if I may, and uh, again, I very much enjoyed reading your paper and your testimony. Uh, you made two points that were particularly striking to me, probably because I agreed with them, which was one, <laughs> that your concern about everybody, we, you know, we just appropriated $25 billion for additional testing. I'm not sure exactly what we're doing with it. Uh, you know, whether we really have a program set up and running for it. 
Uh, same thing about your point uh, on contact tracing. This is an enormously, um, you know, intensive manpower type operation, particularly in something this this size. So, what are the sorts of things you would recommend that we do that you would say, okay, this would be an adequate testing uh, program. This would be an adequate contact tracing program. We've heard from many experts over the last few weeks different plans for what testing capacity we should have and what we would do with that capacity. I'm suggesting we actually start at the other side and figure out what are the components and where is the room to go up on all of those components. That's the part that's not clear to me. As an epidemiologist, I could say, sure, if we could test everybody once a week, that would get us this. If it were every two weeks, we would have these options. But it's not clear to me which of those plans is actually feasible. And so I think it's really important that we, we go step by step and figure that out. And I think we need a national plan in order to do that effectively. I don't think states should be left to do it um, independently. In terms of contact tracing, in addition to using that as an approach for containment, I think we should be prioritizing data collection. CDC recently put out new guidance for how data collection during contact tracing should, rather how data could be collected during contact tracing. And it does incorporate many of the data elements that I think would be really useful. So progress has been made just in the past week on that. I think next we should be sure that that data gets reported and analyzed. I think all of the state health departments should be reporting it, and I think the CDC should as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, and um, now I'd like to recognize Congresswoman Catherine Clark. Thank you for being here. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chairwoman. It's good to see everyone here, and thank you so much for being with us. Um, we understand that, that testing is part of what we need to collect. The data that you so aptly described as the weapon that is going to help us um, defeat this virus and get our economy working up. And I, I very much like your image of a dimmer switch where we can dial things up and down because we want parts of our economy or, or um, places in our different states to be able to open if they can safely do it. But I think it comes back to your box diagram and it starts with testing. And as you described, Dr. Rivers, we are under testing right now. If our goal, and I'd be interested if you both agree the goal, is 1% of the United States population once a week. So that would be roughly 3.8 million tests, and we're now at 1.6. So do you agree that that 1% is, is the, be the right benchmark we should be aiming for? I think that is in the right ballpark, but I would make the point that we don't want to test 1% of America evenly distributed. Right. We want it to be focused on people who are symptomatic, healthcare workers, essential, essential workers. And I would just add to that, we issued an outline, a briefing note of who we think needs to be tested by priority level. Because you could test 1%, but exactly as Dr. Rivers said, if you test the wrong 1%, you're not going to be optimally controlling. You have to look at those with symptoms most likely to spread, most likely to die in congregate facilities, healthcare workers with symptoms, contacts who are symptoms, symptomatic, hospitalized patients even without symptoms because they can spread it widely, all people in a nursing home if there is a case there because there can be explosive spread, essential workers who are symptomatic. So it, I think it's key to, to look at the numbers, but our estimate is that you would need at least two or three times current volume even if you only tested the highest priority people to do it. But that doesn't mean there isn't a lot we can't do at the same time to ramp up our other things because it's not going to be one thing that gets us out of this except a vaccine. That's right. And so we have to do all these things. Um, but with the test, uh, to get to where we need to be, to be testing those essential workers, part of my understanding is the test that we are using now is inefficient and expensive and requires a lot more of the uh, swabs and other uh, equipment um, that we, frankly, are just having shortages of. So. Where are we with point of contact testing, more instant testing, and even if their accuracy is not as good as the current tests we're using, is it worth it if it is more widely distributed and lets us test more of these essential workers and people at the greatest risk? There are two broad ways of testing. For the virus itself, 
through looking for the genetic particles like the PCR that's being done and looking for antibodies. I'll leave antibody testing aside because there are many unknowns about it. For the point of care testing for the virus, there are some systems that are relatively rapid now, but they're low throughput. So you're only going to be testing a few people each hour uh, or people over a four-hour period. Um, so that rapid point of care needs to be looked at. There are newer technologies and older technologies that may be helpful, but you're always going to have to take a good sample, and you're always going to have to be looking for a tiny amount of gen genetic material. Um, so your idea of a test that would have what we'd, we would call a low sensitivity, but still a high specificity, in other words, some false negatives, but it could rule someone in, would be very helpful, but does not yet exist on the market. Okay. Um, what, um, what are some of the limiting factors for reaching just the sheer number of tests that we're going to need, and how can we address them as we look at putting together a, a budget that can really use this, develop the data we need? I tried in earnest to find this out, and I, I wasn't able to determine what the the gaps are, and I think that in itself is a big problem. Uh, I think continuing to bring new platforms onto the market will be helpful, but then what about swabs and what about the PPE that the healthcare workers need to take the samples? It's opaque to me, and I think that's something we could fix. Great. Um, I have just a few minutes left. I would just say that at, at this point, um, I can't underscore and agree with you more on the need for a national plan and that states are too interconnected uh, and we need to be learning from each other and how this virus is being spread and how we can best do these things, test, isolate, trace, uh, and quarantine, and safely bring our economy open. Um, that's the goal of everybody here, uh, but we need to support that in a national way. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. And um, since I come from one of the stay-at-home states and represent a fairly rural district, you know, a, a lot of what I'm going to talk about is why we should treat everything uniform. I mean, rural areas are, can be treated differently because the disease burden is less, the strain on the hospital system, et cetera, et cetera. So first of all, well, Dr. Frieden, you said, and I think I quote here, shelter in place is blunt but effective. Um, we don't really have scientific data on that for coronavirus, do we? Because if you plot actually the, what the states have done versus their, or the severity of the, the measures states have gone versus their case counts, you actually find that the states with less uh, restrictions in place have, sometimes have lower case counts. An example is Florida. So we really have no data, specific objective data about that, do we? Prospectively well, looked at? Um, for, the, for coronavirus, for COVID-19? For COVID-19, if we look at information from around the world, it's very clear that when people stay home, it reduces the spread. But it's also clear, doctor, that there are countries, uh, including Singapore and South Korea, that have been able to limit the amount of physical restrictions or physical distancing and still control the virus. And right. there are differences so, in different environments. So Florida, for instance, didn't put in stay at home, but their case rate is lower than Maryland's, for instance, right? There are many factors that go into what sure. the case rate That's is. Right. That's right. So, so, so my, my point is that, that shelter in place might work, but it might be just the, the, the social distancing that shelter in place obviously implies. Now, uh, Dr. Rivers, I looked at the recommendations from AEI. They're a month old, is that right? Yes. So we've learned a lot in the last month, haven't we, about this disease? So for instance, as we ramp up testing, the first criteria is that your case count has to go down. Well, as you ramp up testing, you're gonna find cases that you wouldn't have found. So for instance, I'm sure you're aware, there's a Michigan prison where they tested all their prisoners, 60% tested positive, they were asymptomatic. In an Ohio prison, 73% tested positive, the vast majority asymptomatic. So there are clearly asymptomatic cases around, and as you ramp up testing, so what you're going to do is you're going to be chasing your tail. In, now, since the entire purpose of restrictions 
was to minimize stress on the healthcare system, right? Because we want our healthcare system to take care of people so that they don't die. Then why wouldn't hospitalizations or ICU occupancy, even more importantly, be the benchmark? Because in Maryland, we have plateaued in ICU utilizations. But our case counts continue to go up as we begin to go into a hot spot, for instance, uh, uh, the processing facilities, poultry processing facilities. Well, you go in there, there are a lot of healthy people. Uh, they, they may have coronavirus, but they're otherwise healthy. They're asymptomatic. You're going to start testing them. You're going to find a whole lot of cases. But that doesn't mean that your community's health care system is overstrained. So why would you choose cases and not hospitalizations or ICU utilization as your benchmark? I would add to your statement that the purpose of lockdowns or stay-at-home orders, it's true, was to prevent overwhelming our healthcare system, but it was also to give us time to build up our capacities to do case-based management, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. So let me talk a little about case-based management, because a lot has been said about contact tracing. Dr. Rivers, what is the for every case that we have diagnosed, what's your estimate of the number of cases that exist that are asymptomatic? People who are asymptomatic, they never had symptoms. So they would never be detected for contact tracing. Emerging evidence is that about 25 to 50% of cases are asymptomatic, but those people would still be affected by quarantine. Now, you do know the, the, uh, the, in, in Stockholm, the estimate is that for every case that's identified, there's 73 cases that haven't been identified. Is that right? Do you, do you know that? You're aware of that statistic? They have not shared their scientific data. So although we have the top okay. line it, number, we don't It's reported. You can Google it. It's reported. So, 70, so, so if we concentrate on contact uh, t tracing, and that's, the, you know, that's our gold standard is we have to have contact tracing, for every patient we contact trace, we could have 10, 20 people who are out there asymptomatic, not contact tracing. And as the description of contact tracing was, well, you know, we're going to educate the people who are infected and the people they could have come, come in contact with about what the good, you know, public health measures are. Wouldn't it be more effective if we've just educated everybody because we really don't know who's an asymptomatic carrier. That is, educate everyone. You know, wear a mask when you go out in public so you don't spread the disease. Make sure you wash your hands. Make sure you don't touch your, touch your face, your nose, your mouth. You know, these are the things as doctors we've known for years. Look, we know how to, how to prevent the spread of respiratory viruses. What we're doing is we're now educating the broader population. But to say that we're going to do this through contact testing and not very broad education, I think means we're going to, we're going to, we're going to set a standard you know, to, to train 100,000 people nationwide and to institute contact tracing could take weeks. I have small business owners in my state who, who, will t who in my district tell me they can't last weeks. They're going to go out of business. So uh, you tell me, Dr. Rivers, why a business owner in my district who sees five customers in a store for an entire day can't safely operate with social distancing masks and hand hygiene? I don't think the economy will be able to recover robustly if people are afraid of getting infected in the community. And so I think it's to the advantage of the economy if we can implement and regain control using case-based So you think it's dangerous for that store owner to open up their store using CDC guidelines? And we won't even get into, because I was going to ask, and maybe in a second round I will, why the WHO guidelines, the World Health Organization guidelines, are so much different from the CDC guidelines. So you think it's dangerous for that store owner to open that? I think customers won't want to visit if they don't have confidence. That's their choice, isn't it, for, on the customers? Thank you. I yield back. Congresswoman Sherry Bustos. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Dr. Rivers and Dr. Frieden, thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us today. Um, I want to ask you about COVID-19 in rural communities. It's uh, uh, the district that I represent in the northwest corner of the state of Illinois, 85% uh, of the towns are 5,000 people or fewer. 60% of the towns are 1,000 people or fewer. So that gives you a, a, a picture of the kind of district that I, I represent. Um, there are people who think that COVID-19 is less serious in rural areas and in, in outside of, you know, not highly populated, not high density of, of population. Um, and so a couple examples that I want to share with you of what we're seeing in this congressional district. We have 102 counties in the state of Illinois. Um, it, two of those counties, one is called Warren County, which is in, in the congressional district I serve, has a population of about 17,000 people, so, so not, not a large population. It now has the fifth highest number of cases per capita in the state of Illinois. 
Another county is Stevenson County. It's on the Wisconsin state line. Um, has a population of about 44,000 people. The number of cases, COVID-19 cases there, are doubling every five days. All right, so um, that is the third fastest rate in the state of Illinois. So just want to give you a little per perspective. So, um, you know, I know, like, if you look nationally, we have many, many governors now who are pushing for uh, the, our country to reopen and um, certainly in their own states looking at reopening. Um, and there are also these ideas that you can, we can reopen in a state um, in tiers, you know, where it's less populated and, and um, versus where it's more populated. So I'm wondering if, if you can address that along the lines of what resources and practices do we need to know in, in more of these rural areas? Um, what, um, do we need a certain level of testing? Maybe if you can just drill down of how it's different in uh, rural America versus, you know, towns like cities like Chicago or New York. And this is addressed to both of you. I'd like to hear from both of you on this, if I could, please. Well, first, I would say that in general, the challenges in urban areas may be more severe. What to do about crowded subway systems, bus systems, uh, very um, close quarters uh, in the U.S. and globally is something that we have not yet figured out and is an enormous challenge. But no area is immune. We don't have immunity to this virus. And um, in each community, there may be nursing homes, there may be factories, there may be other facilities where there is uh, potential for a lot of spread, and there may be less access to the kind of intensive care that is needed in some rural areas of the country. I think something Dr. Rivers said is, is really important to highlight, and that is the importance of data. We are learning more about this virus every day. The famous Nobel laureate Josh Lederberg used to say, the microbes outnumber us. It's their numbers against our brains. And we have to use intelligence to figure out what the weaknesses of the virus are, to understand, for example, where it's spreading, what are the highest risk things. I talked about two dichotomies in my testimony, open versus closed. It's really a question of degree, different things. The second was public health versus the economy. In fact, together we can resolve them. Another false dichotomy is safe and risky. It's really safer and riskier. So we need to make as much of our environment by design, by changing the way we go about our business as safe as possible reduce risk, and we'll do that by understanding more through things like contact tracing where the disease is spreading and how to reduce its spread most effectively. Thank you. Thank you. I would just add that rural areas have seen less explosive growth, which is encouraging, but they also tend to have less capacities. And so I worry that a community may have a manageable level of transmission until a congregate setting like a correctional facility or a nursing home becomes infected and then suddenly the local hospital might have 25 high acuity patients that need to be admitted and the hospital might not be able to accommodate that. And so I think that's the kind of surge capacity that we need to be planning for is supporting rural communities when they do have a change in their epidemiology. Um, I've got 34 seconds left. Rosa, may I ask a second question that, that follows up on this? So um, speaking of correctional facilities, we have two federal prisons in the congressional district I serve. Um, and I, I don't know if you've been following this case uh, very or this this topic very closely, but um, uh, the the marshal service has um, turned over inmates to the Bureau of Prisons to go to eleven different prisons throughout the the country um, for transfer of patients that are not tested for COVID nineteen. One of those prisons is in Thompson, Illinois. Um, this is in a county called Carroll County, uh, zero hospitals there. Um, you'd have to travel over across the Mississippi River to Iowa to go to the uh, a hospital or a county to the north or a county to the south. Um, so uh, wondering um, about screening, the proper screening that should happen before the transfer of any patients, or I'm sorry, any inmates to a, another prison. If you can talk about what would best practices look like uh, for transferring prisoners from one facility to another? Well, the best practice would be to minimize transfers, first and foremost, because anytime you're mixing more people, you're creating the possibility of explosive spread. You would certainly want to ensure that no one who's symptomatic uh, is transferred. 
Uh, the challenge is that we recognize that there are a lot of asymptomatic people, some of them pre-symptomatic, they'll develop symptoms in the next couple of days, and some of them will remain asymptomatic, and they do appear to be able to spread the infection. Uh, that's why even symptom screening will be a problem, and in every congregate facility, we need a comprehensive approach to reducing the risk that the virus will get in, increasing the likelihood we'll find it quickly if it does, and improving our ability to stop it from spreading widely if it's spreading. And I would just add, if there was an opportunity to use diagnostic testing, one misstep or miscalculation that people sometimes make is to think that just because you have a negative diagnosis diagnostic test means you're not infected. The situation you would want to avoid is when you test someone early in their incubation period, and so they're already infected, but there's not enough virus yet for the test to pick up, and so it builds over the coming days, and you think you're in the clear, and you're not. So coupling or timing the testing with a quarantine period would be recommended. All right, thanks to you both. I yield back. Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so, uh, uh, one thing, and this is probably for both both y'all, one thing we've learned from this pandemic is that the importance of domestic production <laughs> uh, of essential medicine and medical supplies. I, I could add to it many other things, but obviously this is what's being highlighted, um, especially in over-reliance on China. Um, however, knowing how many tests we need, what we've just talked about, and how many vaccines, 300 million plus, um, et cetera. I worry there's no way to completely produce all of that within the United States at, at present, um, possibly even with our adjacent allies. Um, this presents a serious threat to our security and our public health. I know that's something we're going to look at prospectively, but we're still in the middle of this. Um, how would you rate our current domestic production capability and what steps do we need to be taking right now today to improve them? I think this pandemic has emphasized the interconnectedness of the world, including both the ability of viruses and other infectious agents to spread and the uh, fragility of some of the supply chains from a variety of products, including the active pharmaceutical ingredients of many of our medications. Um, when it comes to uh, PPE, personal protective equipment, there are means to increase production of safely reusable PPE, such as elastomeric half face piece N95 respirators. This was uh, as an important technology that is uh, not new. It's been around for a while. It's been used increasingly, but it allows a healthcare worker to have an N95 that can be safely disinfected between uses and used for months at a time. So there are some technological um, improvements that can improve our supply chain. In terms of vaccines and therapeutics, we don't yet have any, so we don't know how difficult they will be to manufacture when they do exist. I believe there will be a global commitment to ensuring that there is essentially open source so that once we know how to make it, anyone can make it. And in fact, uh, immediately, even uh, companies that had strongly opposed this for many years have agreed. So I think there's a recognition, there's a global good, but the manufacturing capacity is something that needs I, to be planned for I now. apologize. I have a couple more questions. I appreciate that very much. Did you want to add to that or should I keep going? Okay. Um, as was mentioned, I flew very far to get here, and I want to try and get through as many of these as I can because uh, this is so important, and I appreciate your time. Uh, what we have seen thus far, it appears, it appears that underlying health conditions, diabetes, um, and, and others impact the likelihood that a COVID-19 patient will require hospitalization. Um, additionally, shutdown orders and concerns about exposure have left many impacted with chronic illnesses. I think of end-stage renal disease and others. Uh, delaying medical care, pursuing alternative care sites such as home. I think about people who are waiting for transplants, perhaps a kidney transplant, and they're getting told, you know, they have a donor, uh, a living donor, and they're being told that's elective. I don't know if you've ever been on life support waiting for a kidney, which is essentially what dialysis is, doesn't feel very elective. Um, can you speak to the impact of the virus on those chronic disease communities and what you anticipate going forward? And maybe they're not the immediately, immediately hospitalized ones, right, where they're not in this Im immediate attention sphere, but they're certainly impacted. Could either of you speak to that? Just to acknowledge the importance of this question, there are so many secondary impacts of this pandemic and those with underlying health conditions. As you say, not only are more likely to get 
severe disease when infected with COVID, but are also struggling with managing their conditions. And so I think this does need to be a priority both for this response and also as we do preparedness planning going forward. Thank you. Um, uh, as folks here know, uh, Lucille Roy Allard and I chair the House Maternity Care Caucus. And um, uh, while medical providers are taking all necessary uh, precautions to protect mothers, patients, uh, frontline workers, as women are still giving birth, surprise, surprise, certain things don't just stop because we all said it should. Uh, we're, we're, we are seeing mothers often forced to labor without partners or family members or midwives. In fact, I have a case of a mother who was potentially going to lose her baby and she could not, I mean, they knew it was a pre-existing condition and the father couldn't come with her. Uh, she had her own miracle and the baby lived, but these are the types of things mothers are facing right now. Um, our, uh, as we work to better prepare our countries and our communities for future pandemics, what recommendations would you give to providers and the maternal health community to better protect new and expectant mothers? This is an area of somewhat outside of my expertise, but I think access to personal protective equipment should be one of the primary resources. Our strategic national stockpile was not able to support all of the PPE needs for this pandemic, and I think that's a lesson that we can take going forward that would benefit the maternity community and also healthcare workers broadly. Thank you. You'll back. If I might just tell my colleague that what we did do in terms of the manufacturing effort of $2 billion, I, certainly not, not enough, to BARDA, to support advanced research and development of vaccines, therapeutics, diagnostics, prioritizing platform-based technology with U.S.-based manufacturing capabilities. And in the CARES Act, there was at least $3.5 billion for BARDA. Uh, for the same effort, so that the conversations are, are trying to move in the direction of having more independence in that area. Thanks. Congressman uh, Bonnie Watson Coleman. Thank you, Chairwoman. I want to thank both of you for your coming here today and, and your testimony and also the work you've been doing in this, in this area. Um, yeah. I know that we're going to be safest when there's a vaccine. I know we're going to have um, dust-ups when there is a vaccine as to whether or not everyone will take it. My understanding of, of the development of a vaccine and, 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 and its testing takes a while and that it's, it could be years. Is there any substitution in the efficacy of, a, of, va of a va developing the vaccine, vaccine um, that will countermeasure years? Dr. Frieden, Dr. Rivers. Um, there's nothing more important in the fight against this virus than developing a vaccine. Um, this, the quickest vaccine development so far, historically, has been about four years. Uh, Dr. Tony Fauci has suggested that 12 to 18 months is a possible, and all of us would like to see a vaccine as soon as possible. Uh, there are uh, many, many vaccine candidates being considered and different models of assessing vaccine, vaccine efficacy being developed. Already some of them are in phase one trials. Fundamentally, we need on the one hand to do everything possible to get a vaccine as soon as possible. On the other hand, we need to recognize that vaccine development is uncertain. Right. And it may be a long time uh, and it may not be as effective as we would like. So we need to do everything possible to make a vaccine, but we can't assume that we'll have one, and we need to act accordingly with all of the other measures that we can. Um, that, that's, did you want to say something, Dr. Rivers? I would just add that identifying a safe and effective vaccine is just the first step, and that we also need to think about manufacturing, production, distribution, because those are steps that can take a long time, too. But if we think and plan now, we can also, I think, speed up the timeline on that, those Thank components. You. Under what circumstances are asymptomatic people being tested now in this country? There are various different situations. Most important is when there is an outbreak in a congregate facility. So if there's a case in a nursing home, we would think everyone in that nursing home needs to be tested. What about outside of a, a, a facility? Um, we're seeing some testing done to release people from isolation, uh -huh. that may not be necessary or effective. You don't really know what a faintly positive test means in that circumstance. Uh, but contacts of cases 
could ideally be tested to see if they're infected, yeah. because if they're infected, then contact tracing needs to be done in them also. But Dr. Rivers may have more to say on this. I agree with that. Testing people without symptoms is not currently one of the higher priorities on, on the CDC priority list, and so there's not a lot. So that is a concern to someone like me. I am over 65 years old. I've got some of those conditions that have been raised as potential issues. I can't just stay home. So I need people to be tested in general so that I know that I'm in a more safe environment than a less safe environment. How long do you think it would take us to get there? And isn't it reasonable if not feasible? Isn't it necessary to get there? Universal testing is a strategy that it's not clear to me we will ever have the capacity to carry out. That, and I mean, it's not clear to me. It could be that we do, but I, I, I'm not sure. But an alternate approach is contact tracing that would allow us to regain control if done at the, the level and scale necessary. So you've outlined um, a, a series of conditions that are more optimum for us to be able to open up and come out and do things. Where are we exactly right now, this week, right now, where are we on that sort of spectrum of enough testing, enough contact tracing, enough isolating, enough alternative um, facilities for quarantine? Where are we right now? I hear, I, I, and either one and both can answer. I can start us off. Right now, most states and most communities are still staying home to slow the spread. As we start to move into phase two, which would be a gradual reopening, um, many, some communities do have sufficient diagnostic testing, many communities do not. States, thanks to the appropriations of this committee, have funding now to hire more contact tracers, but I think that the, that capacity is still in progress. So are we like in phase one and a half? We are looking ahead to phase two, I would say. Dr. Frieden. Uh, the way we think of it is there are three things you want to look at. One is what's happening with the virus, are, are, are severe infections coming down, and our estimated number of cases coming down, controlling for the amount of testing. Two, are our healthcare systems robust? So our healthcare workers aren't getting infected on the job, right. and so that we have the capacity to treat a surge, to manage ongoing conditions like pregnancy safely. And three, is our public health system ready to box it in with contact tracing isolation? I would say that there are some communities in some parts of the U.S. that are getting ready to do that, but all of us need to have vigilance. It's not about relaxing. It's about increasing vigilance so that we can prevent explosive spread and save lives and restore our economy. I'd just like to know how close we are to that. I see I'm confused as to where we are. And when we do allow states and when they, the governors allow them to open the cities, I'd like to know what kind of indicators are public health um, professionals willing to say or should say um, that you need to shut it back down or that it's okay to continue in that direction. And I just am not, uh, I'm not knowledgeable about that, and, and I don't get the impression that in general we are. We've looked at that specifically, when to loosen and when to tighten again. And the things that we would look at are things like consistent increasing case counts, increases in what's called syndromic surveillance, which is an early indication, uh, healthcare systems that are beginning to get overwhelmed, yes. and a public health system that can't do the box it in well so we don't know where the cases are coming from and there are unlinked cases in the community. That's the optimal way, but I think we recognize that uh, part of the stay at home may be able to be um, changed without undue risk. For example, outdoor activities and other things with physical distancing. And when we go out, it's not going to be back to normal. It's going to be to a new normal with hand sanitizer and perhaps face masks where it's spreading widely and no touch doors and no touch elevator buttons and lots of ways to engineer risk out of our lives. Thank you. I yield back. I forgot I had my mask on. I can just breathe for a second. <laughs> Thank you very much. I yield back. Please breathe. I, I, just to follow up for, for, for a second for, for a question, but the American people deserve the truth. The American people, it, it's on the one hand, it's here, and on the one hand, it's that. Where? And we are looking to you 
to understand. You know, we hear on, on TV, and this is the ordinary person, we have access to probably other kinds of information, but it's vaccine, how many, how many are being uh, 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 reviewed? What are various different lines of re reviewed? What are the main ones? Are there 40? And of that 40, there are only two that are real. Is there a national testing plan? I believe you said no, we do not have a national testing plan. We do not have a national contact tracing plan. We do not have PPE, no command and control of where, where, what that is and where it is going. And the American people are scared. They are scared. They don't know what to believe, and they may not go into that business that Dr. Harris talked about. And they're not. Look at the polling data. They're not going. So. What do we get to? And we need the answers. Let me ask, are the CDC guidelines on the testing being followed? Kind of yes or no. I mean, because I, I want to be mindful of my colleagues' time as well. Are those CDC guidelines being followed about who gets tested and who doesn't? Or is it just a jump ball? I mean, that's the way it appears to me that we do not have a kind of a central control of what is happening. As you have pointed out, in the worst pandemic, going back to, 2000, to, to, to 1918. So how are the American people going to get the answers that they need? How are we? You need to tell us what public policy initiatives need to be put in place. You have a subcommittee here. It is bipartisan. It is critically important. And so many of these pieces are within our jurisdiction that we need to understand. We're not foolish enough to know that there's not absolute clarity, but hell, give us more clarity than we have now in order to be able to provide the wherewithal to those who are in charge to carry out their mission. On testing, quick question. Should the CDC be in charge of that, of that effort? Should the states be in charge of that effort? I, and again, I need quick answers because I'm going to run out of time. The federal government needs to establish the guidelines, provide the resources. The implementation is done at the state and local level. Okay. Our state and local level does not have the resources today that it needs to do its job. Yes? There are not enough tests currently. Well, but... In, in a normal set of circumstances, the public health infrastructure in this country is weak. And it's being overrun. Not that it hasn't wanted to do the job, it's being overrun. So as your point earlier, we need to do something of, 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 about that. Look, we, you know, is there a plan if we have a vaccine? How does it get manufactured? How does it get prioritized? Are there people sitting down as far as you know now? And I'm looking to the scientists. I'm looking to you. Because we know what havoc politics can play. And I put that aside. You're the guideposts. Sure. Give us the plan. And let us know absolutely. And when the American public can say, it's not going to happen for 18 months. They're not dumb. We need truth and facts at this time. I was not prepared to just 
go in this direction, but we cannot say on the one hand this and on the one hand that if we are going to get out of this and give us the posts to get us out of this, the pillars that help us to gain that control so that we can move forward as a country. I went over my time. I apologize, Tom. You're the chairman. You never go over your time, <laughs> Madam Chair. Uh, and I respect that and respect uh, the concerns that you went through. Let, let me get, because I think uh, the chair is right, we're looking for specifics. So let me ask a very specific question to both of you. I think one of the, um, you know, early lessons from this is we certainly didn't have the, the, the um, public lab testing capabilities, let's say, that we needed to respond as quickly as all of us would have liked to respond. So just to ask you in your professional opinion, is that true? And number two, how would you go about remedying that? So that would be... Part one. Number two, and, and I could be wrong about this and would be happy to be corrected, I also thought we were a little slow getting our, our private sector partners into the fight for whatever reason. I don't know if there's a barrier there. I don't know if the, you know, we have to assure the market. Uh, I realize these are for-profit companies. They have to, to make money. But I don't think we mobilized them nearly as rapidly as we probably should have in retrospect. So the two questions would be, what do we need to do to get our public uh, health labs up to where they need to be? What mechanisms do we need to be in place so that if we find ourselves in an all-out war with a microbe, we have everybody on the field as quickly as we can get them there? Just to tie together your two questions, we've spent a lot of money and time on hospital preparedness and making sure that our private medical facilities are able to respond to a mass casualty event. We don't have something like that for diagnostics, and I think we should, because it's not just public health labs, although we should be working to in increase their capacities. It's also the private sector, as you mentioned, and so I think we should have some sort of unifying preparedness program for how we will make sure we are not caught in this position again when it comes to diagnostics. Dr. Fried? It's certainly the truth that the public health laboratories at national, state, and local levels are, are uh, antiquated. They're not using the latest technologies. They're still using fax machines. Uh, it's the testing methodologies. It's information technology. And so that's something that needs to be upgraded. It's also the case um, that we need to look at new platforms and newer diagnostic technologies. There are innovations coming, and they're not cheap. They will be expensive, but you want to keep your fire department there in case there's a fire in the same way you want to keep your lab ready. Unfortunately, the lab is often the poor relation in the healthcare uh, infrastructure. And for this kind of a response, it's really a three-legged stool. You have the public health system doing public health laboratory testing. You have hospital laboratories developing their own tests. And you have the private sector coming in with large volumes. And in this case, uh, all three of them had problems. Yeah, uh, we actually uh, dealt a little bit with that in one of our last hearings before we were overtaken. The CDC was actually talking about developing uh, a plan uh, in terms of the technological updates they needed and bring it to us. So I, I would hope, you know, they've, they've obviously been dealing with a lot, but I hope that has not uh, flipped through the cracks because we're going to need something like that, I think, going forward. And uh, that, that's a very specific investment that, uh, uh, that we could make. Let me ask you a, a very different question, if I may. Um, we've talked a lot about vulnerable groups, and we know we certainly have vulnerable, we have health disparities in the country, we have minority groups, we have uh, lower income groups, we have a lot of people that find themselves with higher degree of vulnerability, much worse outcomes than the population in general. Uh, and I, I want to talk about that maybe in a later round, but I also want to ask about children. I had an interesting occasion I was mentioning to Dr. Harris where I was talking to an ambassador from a friendly European country during all this. And I said, what are you doing? And so one of the things we're doing in terms of getting back is we're actually opening our schools a lot faster than you guys are because our children are not particularly vulnerable. And uh, a lot of their parents are in their 30s and 40s. They're the workers that we actually need to get the economy going up again. And they're not as vulnerable, obviously, as others. So do you have any thoughts in terms of, number one, what is happening with younger people in, in this? Uh, and number two, and not asking for master blueprint on what we should do, but would, would uh, are, do you have concerns about the school system and getting kids back up and operational and parents more able to get to the workplace? Thankfully, we are able to observe that children are at lower risk of severe illness. That's something we've seen in other countries. It's something we're seeing in the United States, and so that's encouraging. What we don't know is 
what role children play in transmission. We know from pandemic influenza, or rather influenza generally, that children are really central to transmission in the community, not just in schools, but the community broadly. We haven't been able to pin down the science yet of what exactly the role is of children in transmission, and so that's where you see a lot of the uncertainty. These two factors weigh against each other and make it very difficult to come to a decision. So I suggest that as other countries move toward reopening, which is happening, some countries are, are going back to school in the coming weeks, they will be collecting data and doing the analyses that will let us understand what the role of children is, and I think that will be helpful for informing our decision. I, I agree with all of that. I would just say it, we don't know why children and women are less likely to get severe illness with COVID-19. It's a clue for something about the virus. But as we reopen, we want to prioritize societal benefit. For example, daycares. If we keep out from daycare kids who have underlying condition and staff who are older who have underlying conditions at risk, that may be a way of starting to reopen. But we also have to consider if those kids get infection, the staff get infection and come home and they're living with their grandparents, are they a risk there? And we don't know. But I, I do think that there's a, a, a valid argument to be made for a sooner reopening of uh, areas with younger people because of the lower risk, but you have to do it in a way that minimizes risk and recognizes uh, the vulnerable population that need to be um, protected as well as the risk of onward transmission. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Congresswoman Clark. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and thank you again for all of this. Uh, I wanted to just start with a broad question, if you could name a country that you think is doing a good job and if they have a national plan. Singapore has done a very good job and they do have a national plan. Any others oh. come to mind? Or? There, there are many countries that are-, that are Do uh, any of them not have a national plan? Do, do any countries who successfully have done this have said we're, we're gonna do this regionally or by city? I think there's a varying degree of centralization and decentralization in different countries. So even Germany, which has a very effective response, has a very decentralized form of government. So there is a strong national guidance, but uh, regional implementation of that guidance in, as far as I understand. Yeah, but they certainly have a more unified healthcare system for delivery. Yes. Um, as we look at uh, testing essential workers, I think it's easier to think about healthcare workers but how do we, how do you start to look at one area that I'm very interested in to follow up on the ranking members question is childcare. Childcare is critical to reopening our economy. We are not going to have success if we don't have childcare system, which has been so underfunded and teetering at the brink. Would you see sort of employer based testing? Is that how we would, you know, with a child care center, maybe smaller, would you test every teacher within those essential? Would you be looking at auto uh, manufacturing plants? Would you test everyone coming onto the floor? Or would you do something more like what Dr. Gottlieb uh, suggested, testing everybody who shows up at a doctor's office, whether that's a, for a sprained ankle or for symptoms of coronavirus. I'll make a brief comment then. Uh, I completely agree that daycare is, child care is particularly important and we've highlighted that in the materials from Resolve to Save Lives from day one that this may be an area that can open sooner as long as we do it safer, which means if there's a kid with an underlying condition, they shouldn't go in. If there's a staff with an underlying condition, they shouldn't go in. We should use hand sanitizer frequently. I think the the, the um, potential of mass testing is just that, it's a potential. In order to do that kind of testing, you're talking about tens of millions of tests a day. And uh, as ex exactly as Dr. Rivers said, we don't know whether that will be feasible, but I don't think it's realistic to wait to reopen some of the most critical aspects of society until uh, there is that kind of capacity. I agree with that, and again, coming back to not having clarity about what kind of capacity we can expect, but I also, um, I think we need to understand more about the logistics of how that would work. If you had a point of care test that could be right here that can only test five people an hour, how would that work if you have an entire daycare center that needs to be tested? I think there are probably ways around that, but I, it, it hasn't been worked out. And so my point is I don't think that we should rely on having that capacity. I think we will have to be prepared to move forward without it. So how would you see getting these, you know, getting the testing done for the 1% that I understand will, will vary in region in the country, will vary 
How, how do you see that going forward? Do you see something like Dr. Gottlieb suggested, where it would be people who come into doctor's offices so that you're getting a random sample? Starting with people who have symptoms, and the nice thing about contact tracing is once you get in that network and once you are connected to people who are infected and the people who might get infected because they have been exposed, you can continue to follow the network outward. And so you don't have to be as concerned about checking here, there, and everywhere because you really start to get a handle on transmission in the community. So this sort of brings us back to where we started, that to even open something essential like childcare that we're going to need to open quickly and support as we're looking at tremendous uh, you know, instability in a critical underpinning of our economy, we can't begin to do that until we have robust testing and tracing and quarantining. The sooner we establish the box it in strategy of test, isolate, contact tracing, and quarantine, the sooner and safer we can re-emerge. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let me just ask a little about the box it in strategy. So, so Dr. Frieden, how many people do you think there are asymptomatic for everyone that we have a diagnosed because, you know, we talk about the number of cases, but we should be very specific. We mean the number of cases confirmed by testing. And, of course, what is your impression? How many cases are there that aren't confirmed by testing, the asymptomatic? Well, there are two different questions there. One is how many people were symptomatic and not tested, and then how many people are asymptomatic and not tested. So the, the number of infections we've documented is a small fraction of the total. And what fraction do you think that is? It depends on the area of the country and the level of the test. So it could be kind of high, right? So, so how do you box in something when you're not recommending testing asymptomatic people, but you know there are asymptomatic people out there? And again, it comes to, the, to, to my question, uh, why wouldn't we just have very intensive education processes so that every American follows social distancing, wearing a mask, and uh, you know, hand hygiene. They, so we kind of hammer this in, because these are the principles, and get a test if you're symptomatic. So I, I think that's correct. I think we can do both, and we have to do both, because this is a very infectious virus, and it's very deadly for but, certain people. But the, but the criteria for reopening include the need, and I've seen this where it's been suggested, don't reopen until you have contact testing in place. What we can say is you will be safer if you're able to well, open with contact tracing. We're safer in place. if we're not born. We're safer from death if we're not born, right? I mean, the bottom line is there's some element of risk. And I, I bring this back to uh, the, to, um, you know, stay at home might work in New York because if you leave your home in New York, you're going to get on a train, you're going to get on a subway, you're going to get in a crowded street. But if you're in, my, in parts of my district, you're going to leave home get in your car or truck, drive to a store that has almost no customers in it, conduct your business, and go back home, because that's normally the way you live. So why would you insist that, or why is there insistence that stay at home is, a, the broad blanket statement, it's effective, because I will, I'm not sure it adds anything more in the instance I just gave you in a rural area. So why do we have a kind of one-size-fits-all approach when we can be much more nuanced about it? I think the concept of physical distancing is an important one. And in the scenario you outline, if the individual goes to the store and, for example, calls in advance, picks up the order at the, at the front, that's a very low-risk interaction. If uh, you go out and, and work outdoors, that's a very low-risk interaction. Right, so, so I would suggest, you know, I visited, and, a, you know, a couple of the stay-at-home things that just didn't, don't make sense to me. Uh, recreational boating is, is prohibited in my state. So a family that stays at home, eats at home, they don't wear masks at home, they can't go out, get on their boat, and go out in the outdoors. Uh, golf courses, as you know, outdoor, uh, they are the, uh, there are guidelines in place that would absolutely physically separate you from other people. Um, are these things that, again, nuanced approaches that, you know, stay at home is all, you know, one, one size fits all. Everybody got to stay at home no matter what it is you're going outside to do. 
Can't we get more nuanced given the data we have and knowing how social distancing, wearing a mask, hand hygiene uh, will likely be the major way to stop spread of this in some circumstances? I think that's generally correct. One other factor to consider is environmental contamination. Uh, COVID is spreading like a super SARS, and we know that SARS spread through elevator buttons, door handles, and other ways. So we have to think also about re-engineering some of our environments. So we have no touch doors, and we reduce the number of contaminated surfaces and clean them more reliably. This is about adjusting to a new normal, and the sooner we do that, the sooner we can get our economies back without unduly stressing our health and healthcare systems. Sure, just two, uh, two additional things. One, uh, the, uh, kind of novel ideas that are coming forward. One is the ability to test, because you know, nasal swabs are a problem, but my understanding there are tests now that are being licensed that work on sputum, so, so just salivary tests uh, for the, uh, and, and what do you think the effect of that will be on, on availability of testing? The other one are the, the uh, new antivirals that are being uh, spoken about, obviously remdesivir, you know, made by Gilead, which took money from the money they made from hepatitis C drugs and, you know, reinvested in helping us cure this, as well as the monoclonal antibody discovery uh, in Israel reported, uh, I think, two or three days ago. Will these change the playing field? I think we have to see. Um, that we're learning more about this every single day, and the more we learn, the more we can do. And is sputum testing, uh, is, it, is it likely that it will work, that, that you can actually test uh, if you're sensitive, you know, sensitive enough assay for virus and so you don't need a nasal swab? I would need to see the data on it. Okay. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if you can uh, share with us the, the patient experience, the, the, a patient who has COVID-19 goes to the hospital. Um, what's the, how long is it taking there? What's the treatment? Um, and then what's the hospital bill look like? If you could maybe talk through that. Uh, one thing um, is that for many patients, it doesn't require a hospitalization. And in areas of the country like New York City, where there are overwhelming numbers of patients, what has been said for the past couple of months is, if you're just mildly ill, stay home. Right. Because you're going to come in, uh, you're going to use up scarce resources. If you don't have it, you might get infected. If you do have it, you might infect someone else. And if you have it, you'll just be told, go home. Uh, that may not be the right answer. The right answer may be, uh, if you can't be safely cared for at home, because you may infect your grandmother or someone who's got cancer, uh, come into this facility and we'll care for you until you're no longer infectious. And that's something that we need to think going forward. But for someone who comes into the hospital, um, what we're seeing is very low levels of oxygen uh, in the blood. And that's a, a big concern. So oxygenation is a major component of care, is probably the most important part of supportive care of someone with COVID. And uh, doctors in intensive care units are figuring out ways to support oxygenation without intubation and use of ventilators. That's a new finding in intensive care and reduces the number of ventilators we thought would be needed. Um, the, what, what is that care if you don't need the, uh, the ventilator? There are a variety of ways to position patients or give oxygen through other means that don't require insertion of a breathing tube and may be effective. Okay. Uh, and then general supportive care for the individual, making sure that they're well cared for. Um, we've seen very severely ill patients in cities that have been hard hit uh, having a, a very low survival rate, uh, partly because they're so severely ill, partly because uh, systems are somewhat overwhelmed. Um, we're learning more about how to care for patients all the time. Uh, there is potentially good news with remdesivir, the antiviral. It appeared to shorten the time to recovery in a well-done study that hasn't yet been released, but uh, the data has been shared. Um, it had a Can you non talk a little bit about that? Reduce it by? From 15 days to 11 days. Okay. Uh, and it reduced uh, mortality rate by about 30%, although that difference wasn't statistically significant significant given the size of the sample. So a trend, a non-significant trend toward a lower death rate. Okay. Um, I'm guessing if you are hospitalized, this is going to result in probably thousands of dollars in hospital bills? I intensive care is extremely expensive. And do we have any hard numbers associated with what an average um, stay is going to, to look like for, for patients? 
No, I'm sorry. Okay, all right. Um, and, and part of this, I want to make an editorial comment in that um, Congressman Lloyd Doggett, uh, Congresswoman Susan Wild, and I have a bill that would call for the opening up of the uh, re-enrollment for the Affordable Care Act right now. When, when we have 30 million uninsured Americans and in the state of Illinois, we have, we have 800,000 uninsured Americans. So I, I actually partially wanted you to go through that. I mean, we know this is going to be very costly. I mean, we know it by the, you know, the economic recovery bills that we're looking at. But I just think it's critically important. The Trump administration has pushed back on um, opening uh, re-enrollment. Um, ours calls for a, an eight-week period where people can, can get in, uh, be re-enrolled in, in uh, the Affordable Care Act. And I just think, and, and Dr. Frieden, you've been obviously in the Obama administration very involved in the Affordable Care Act, but um, I think that's important to note. I mean, what you just talked through is that's a, it's a long process. Glad that we're seeing some encouraging news out of the, the treatment in the hospitals. Um, I want, want to ask you also about uh, behavioral health. Um, if you can talk a little bit about that from a public health perspective, um, what we're seeing as far as what's happening be with behavioral health, what we need to prepare for going forward, and just what we can do as members of the Labor, Health, and Human Services Subcommittee of Appropriations as we look at that. Maybe we'll start with you, Dr. Rivers. Yes, I think this is an important area. Uh, going back to our previous discussions about uh, the secondary consequences of this pandemic and the support and treatment and um, co continuity of care that people have had, I think behavioral health is one area that is chronically underserved and under supported. And I think it's very possible that in the context of this pandemic that those disparities will intensify. I would just outline four areas of concern. The first is interruption of uh, needed care, either ongoing care or need for new care in the behavioral health area. Second is substance abuse and chemical dependency and the need for treatment and potential increased uh, need for treatment and care. Uh, the acute trauma of grieving and losing family members or family members severely ill, and also the responders, first responders and healthcare workers. I was health commissioner in New York City after 9-11, and we studied the impact of the World Trade Center attacks. And we found that as severe as the respiratory impacts were of people caught in the dust cloud, in terms of the amount of disability, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, depression, and anxiety caused even more disability. So we have to take care of our responders during this time and limit their hours to the extent possible and provide good care and support. Very good. Thank you to both of you. I yield back. Congresswoman Herrera Butler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, on that last part with regard to mental health um, and, and, and the impact this is having not just on our first responders, although they are constantly in our hearts and minds because they're the ones that are taking it, taking it in 24-7. Um, one of the things I think with regard to, you know, Congressman Harris's comments about kind of a nuanced approach to reopening, I've just recently called on the federal government to reopen. So Washington State, we've, we've been dialing, we dialed back, we're starting to dial back open. Um, and this governor has reopened uh, state state parks, or at least he's put he's doing them in a phased approach. So people are able to leave their house, go to a safe place that has a lot of space and distance, but it has an impact, especially if you have family, you know, kids, you're all in the house together, and it lets them release a little bit. I've just recently asked that the feds reopen the federal land in our area because they closed it off in, in cooperation with the state when it made the shutdown order. So now I think it's time to start opening those things off up. I would like to know on the recreational side what types of things you see as nothing's 100% safe. Let's go ahead and throw that out there. But could help ba out balance out the the mental health piece. You know, I've been thinking and been very concerned about domestic violence and uh, violence with regard to children. You know, the reports have gone way down because they're not in school and school, you know, educators aren't able to see things and make calls. It's not that they're not happening. So could you please speak to the health piece with regard to reopening some of these things? I agree that outdoor areas are low risk for transmission and that they are, play a really important role in, in mental health and overall well-being, and so I do support the reopening of those outdoor areas. Complete agreement um, would encourage, actually, that. The only things you want to be careful about is 
Where do people go after they go outdoors? Do they congregate in a bar inside? And are there any things like doorknobs or uh, spaces that are that just can be easily re-engineered to be safer? But absolutely. Well, and in addition, I think as the public is more educated, I don't, I don't see anybody who, I mean, most people carry around hand sanitizer, right? You, you use it before you touch your, before you eat. So you take your own lunch, you go sit out there, you're going to gather up all your garbage, you're going to put your hand sanitizer on before you eat. I mean, people, I think, I think, um, we need to to begin to show the American people that we are seeing and hearing their stress, and not just the folks who are in the middle of the fight, but those who are in rural areas, those who are held back. You know, we're, we're almost a victim of our success in certain ways that we haven't had, and I'm so grateful. We've worked very hard to not allow our local health systems in my district to be overwhelmed. But because that isn't happening, People aren't seeing the immediacy of the crisis, and we have to respond to them in that. And so that's, I think that nuance, especially coming from our public health uh, experts, is going to help us, uh, I think, it'll help in the long term with regard to adherence, um, but it'll gain some trust. The other, the other thing I wanted to, to bring up and ask about was um, nursing homes. Obviously, that is a hot spot. Um, and then they continue to be a significant portion of our COVID patients and COVID deaths, um, including, um, I think that's not just in my area, it's, it's nationwide. A high number of those patients who travel um, three times a week to dialysis or nursing home, uh, to dialysis are nursing home residents. And this figure could increase during the pandemic. What special protections can, can we be looking at for these individuals, um, for them and for the staff? A lot of how these viruses have been spread. Originally it could have been visitors, but now they're really only their outside, it's healthcare providers and or their staff. We've talked a lot about testing and when we should test and where we should test. For me, this is a really appropriate opportunity to do that universal testing. I think that all staff who are working in care settings should have access to tests and should be tested regularly for that exact purpose. We know that nursing home residents are at very high risk of severe illness. The virus spreads very easily in those settings, and so I think that is the perfect opportunity to intervene. I, I just completely agree. I'm deeply concerned about nursing homes. In fact, exactly uh, um, two months ago, I said that nursing homes were ground zero for COVID-19 in the U.S., and as I said in my opening statement, uh, unless urgent action is taken, there will be at least 100,000 deaths in nursing homes in this country, and that means taking a comprehensive approach. Uh, making sure there's leadership in the nursing home at every level, every unit, every shift. Making sure we take a hierarchy of controls, including source controls, administrative engineering, and personal controls, uh, cohorting staff and patients, uh, coming up with novel ways to try to keep staff and patients safe. Some nursing homes are paying staff extra to stay there so they're not uh, exposing others. That's a very costly and difficult thing to do. If if, if uh, it turns out that antibodies reflect immunity, maybe we can have people who have immunity care for others in nursing homes. We have to do something so that we don't have that kind of terrible devastation. Thank you. Yield back, Madam Chair. Congresswoman Watson Coleman. Thank you. Liberated. Thank you both. Um, th this has been a tremendous learning experience for me. I wanted to ask you a couple of questions about our sense of connectivity to the rest of the world. Um, what do you think, for instance, is the um, true impact of the decision that our president made to withhold funding to the World Health Organization? What do you think that that, that has as in terms of a short-term, mid-term, or even long-term negative implication? We're in the midst of the most severe public health pandemic in a century. Uh, WHO uh, is our global health organization, and we need to support it and make it stronger. I think we can look with time to see, do we need a different approach? Do we need a supplemental approach? What are ways that it could be more effective? I think every organization will need to look back and see how it could have been more effective. But the WHO has a critical role to play and uh, we hope it will be able to play that with uh, ever-increasing effectiveness uh, in the weeks, months, and years to come. I, I don't know if you wanted to weigh in, Dr. Rivers. Of... I'll just add that we know from this experience and from everything we know about infectious diseases that a threat anywhere in the world is also a threat to the United States. And so 
would also like to point out that it's in our national interest to make sure that the rest of the world is able to respond effectively, and WHO is the tool that we have to, to do that and to ensure that. Thank you. Um, another question I have about, uh, in support of all of my colleagues have spoken to the need for a national plan, um, cohesiveness, uh, in, in how we approach it, how we deal with it through all the various phases, and how we can create, um, hopefully, more dependability uh, by having a national plan. What is your reaction to the proposal to shut down the um, task force, the coronavirus task force? Is it an okay thing? Is it problematic? Um, what should we be thinking about that? I would say it depends what comes next. Uh, at Resolve to Save Lives, an initiative of the Global Health Organization Vital Strategies, we advise governments all over the world in how to prepare for and respond to an epidemic. And one of the essential components of an effective response is a clear what's called incident management system, where there is an incident manager in charge, there is transparent information, the incident manager reports up to the highest authority and raises the policy decisions that need to be made, which are then made and implemented through the incident management system. That is the best practice in how to handle an emergency like this. Mm -hmm. So whatever structure is there, I would hope it would follow that best practice. I think that that has been one of our challenges is that we've had so many people on the same base at the same time staking out little pieces and sometimes colliding with one another as they're trying to get to home plate. And so to me, it's very important that we have a, a cohesive plan of action, a one voice, um, and an agreement among all of the agencies that would be inputting into that. I, my other question has to do with the, um, the minority communities, the black community, the Native Americans, the Hispanic, and the very poor communities. A lot of their access to health care has been diminished because of the um, health care facilities, the FQHCs and stuff not operating um, to par, if at all. How, what do we need to do to ensure that they are not uh, deprived of either the therapies or the vaccine once it becomes available to the degree that the uh, infection has disproportionately impacted those communities? We've seen three problems. One, uh, larger proportion of essential workers in uh, some underrepresented communities. Two, higher proportion of diabetes, under controlled diabetes and other underlying health conditions. And three, lesser access to healthcare services. Um, if and when we have a vaccine, it needs to be provided to those who need it most first. That would be healthcare workers and other essential workers. And as it's rolled out to everyone, everyone in society, because that will protect mm -hmm. all of us. I agree with Dr. Frieden, and I would just add that although we do not have a safe and effective vaccine yet, that's the kind of thinking and planning that we can and should be doing now so that we can really take our time to identify the best way forward. Thank you. And, and finally, I just want to say that I was really impressed with this discussion that you both approached at some point about looking forward and being prepared for disease X that's going to come along. I, th I think that we are very fortunate. Um, no, we're not. We're not fortunate with what we're experiencing right now, although I suspect it could be worse. But this is pretty doggone bad. And we have the smartest country in the whole wide world, as far as I'm concerned, the most amazing country in the whole wide world. And we ought to be better positioned uh, should there become, and when there becomes, another incident of this nature or anything close to it. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. With, with, the, with the agreement of the um, ranking member, what I would like to do is, uh, as I mentioned, that w we have um, members who could not uh, be, be here. So, uh, And uh, I know that there are uh, three members on our side of the aisle who had a question which I'd like to pose on their behalf. And I don't think that there are any further questions. Is that correct, Tom? Right. Thank you. Okay, so let me, and I'll try to... Um, uh, uh, give you the, uh, the sense of the, um, of the question. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Congressman Mark Pocan of Wisconsin, um, his question is, um, uh, 
In order to safely reopen our communities, experts like Dr. Gottlieb have recommended being able to consistently test 1% of our population every week. 50,000, that means in Wisconsin, 50,000 tests per week. Um, do you feel that the federal government should play a role in helping states secure testing supplies so they can safely reopen? Um, what should we federal government uh, do to take uh, to ensure our communities have testing and the contact tracing capacity they need to safely address the pandemic? Uh, are the guidelines from CDC um, on who should be prioritized accurate in your view? Are they missing anyone? Um, such as essential workers, folks working at factories still, or our first responders. And I would add to that list, I'm sure Mark wouldn't mind, because one of the questions I wanted to ask is about our folks who are in the meat and poultry, poultry processing of, of plants. And the president is designating meat and poultry processing plants as essential infrastructure that must stay open. Now, I don't know about everyone here, sure, maybe, but I have been uh, to both a poultry pl uh, processing place and a meat processing place. You just watch how those people are standing right next to each other as either chickens or beef just go by. And so um, how do we deal with them as well? So let me lay that one out. Yes, I do think the federal government should play a role in obtaining testing supplies for the states. What we don't want is a situation where all 50 states are having to devise their own strategies and bidding against each other and we really need a central coordinating function in order to make that run smoothly. And I think the same largely goes for contact tracing. Uh, in that, the federal government plays an important role in issuing guidance and supporting state and local health departments in doing this work. But our public health in the United States really does happen at the state and local level, and so I do think it's appropriate that those functions be carried out at those levels. The CDC testing priorities largely revolve around people who are hospitalized first and foremost with COVID-like symptoms, those with symptoms who don't require hospitalization, healthcare workers, and I do think those are appropriate testing priorities given our limited resources, but that's not to say that people in these essential roles, like those working in manufacturing and meatpacking facilities, should not become essential. It's just a matter of getting our testing capacity to the point that we are able to support that. I would agree with all of that and just request that we had issued a brief on exactly this question, just two pages on who should be, should tested, be tested, how many are in each group, and what the level of prioritization mm -hmm. is, and if we can enter that into the record. Yes, we'd like to have generally that. in close agreement with the right. CDC recommendations. Yeah, right. And you also have, besides the, the, uh, the uh, meat and poultry processing plants, prisons have become now a, a place that we really need to look to. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of our colleague, Lucille Roybal Allard, this is about CDC authority. And she talks about uh, you, Dr. Frieden. Um, you have been the uh, CDC has been an authoritative voice in the country uh, to prevent uh, the spread of infectious disease. Um, back in January, or February, we were learning about the, the novel uh, uh, coronavirus. CDC leadership, particularly Dr. Messonnier, Dr. Redfield, were present uh, several days a week and testifying in hearings, providing guidance. Um, however, once the stay-at-home efforts began, CDC became disturbingly absent in their visibility, silent in their recommendations. Let me just paraphrase. You consider problematic uh, that the, uh, the task force contained one CDC representative, and for the most part, the briefings in the last two months, Dr. Redfield was not invited to be part of the presentation. Given your own experience, is it normal that CDC not be more directive in response to the outbreaks in meat processing plants, federal directives uh, that these plants stay open even when they do not have protocols in place to protect workers? Should CDC be mandating the use of face masks in public venues, insisting that face masks be made available to all individuals entering stores and other public places? What role should CDC be playing in addressing this tragic epidemic of COVID in our nursing homes. All about the CDC, Dr. Frieden, but would you know? <laughs> First to say that CDC has 20,000 health professionals who dedicate their lives to protecting Americans. The National Center for Immunization and Respiratory Disease has more than 700 uh, FTE staff who are experts in this area. They have spent decades working on the public health control of respiratory viruses. 
Dr. Ann Shuket, the principal deputy director, was the former director of that center in addition to being the principal deputy of CDC. Dr. Bessonnier is the current director of that center. Mm -hmm. uh, others in that center uh, are deeply experienced and deeply committed to this. And many parts of CDC also have deep expertise in infection control, for example, and nursing home care. Uh, CDC is, is not, does not have the authority to mandate. Right. CDC provides guidance. But I will say that even as I am an infectious disease specialist, I've spent 30 years on infectious disease control, I've run two large public health agencies, I would not take action without detailed input from the experts at CDC because they are the world's top, top experts in this. Mm -hmm. And I will feel safer when we're hearing from them regularly. Mm -hmm. But I would also say that the American people have voted with their clicks because by this date, CDC's website has had something like 1.4 billion clicks. Mm -hmm. And it's still the best place to go for information, advice, guidance, and recommendations to keep you, your family, your workplace, your school, mm -hmm. your daycare safer. And essentially what that would mean, though, if that CDC cannot mandate, we understand that. Uh, but certainly, I can imagine in your time, with regard to these meat and poultry processing plants, that uh, you worked closely with OSHA and with the USDA uh, on th these issues, as well as state health departments to, uh, to, to make these happen. But you were, in effect, leading the way, is, is the point, that CDC took a major role in, in this effort. And that is with the guidelines as well, which is why I asked the question, are we, um, you can't mandate this, but are we implementing everywhere in this country the CDC guidelines with response to testing? And I think the answer to that is no, but in any case. Um, um, I don't know if you want to comment on the CDC piece, Dr. Rivers. No, thank you. Right. Thank you. Okay. And Congresswoman Lois Frankel of Florida. Um, again, this is similar to early. Testing is the key. There's inconsistency on uh, how much testing needs to be done, uh, hundreds of thousands, um, and uh, we are currently testing less than 200. Uh, give us again the benchmark for the number of tests we should be doing in this country. Estimates start at 3.5 million per week and go up from there. Okay. Our next question, do we have the, ca the capacity to provide this? Not yet. Okay. What will we have to do to achieve the capacity? The steps aren't clear to me, but I think that should be a priority. Mm -hmm. Who should determine the steps? The federal government. Okay, she has... Um, She asks, based on your, 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 your knowledge of the timeline of the, of, of the, of the response, um, she talked about November. U.S. intelligence officials began warning of virus sweeping through Wuhan region of China. It took more than 70 days from the first con confirmed case in the U.S. for the administration to take serious action. Based on your knowledge of the timeline of the response, was there anything more that could have been done to contain the spread? Um, and also, she points out that in May of 2018, uh, the administration disbanded the White House pandemic response team, uh, later received a report warning that the U.S. is not prepared to respond to a severe influenza-like pandemic. Do you have an opinion as to whether disbanding the pandemic response team was appropriate? And that's, was there anything more that could have been done? Okay. This is exactly why we need a health defense operations appropriation so that whatever the status of the budget, Americans can be safer because we have a stable source of funding to protect us from health threats at home or abroad. Okay. Uh, just thinking about the first question, it's always true in public health that we prefer prevention and it's easier to stay ahead of something than it is to regain control. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lesson here in front of us now though, as we are really in the midst of our pandemic that we need to be forward looking and- Forward looking, right. Let me just say, okay, um, I, I'm going to ask uh, Congressman Cole if he has some um, closing comments, and then I will close. Thank you very much, Madam Chair, and I want to thank both our witnesses. It's been um, exceptionally helpful testimony, and 
Uh, very uh, forthright and, and compelling answers, and I appreciate uh, you both. I want to thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this hearing. I did at the beginning. I think it's a very important uh, hearing to hold, and uh, uh, you ask a lot of your members because this is the only reason why we're in town, and I'm very pleased with all the members of the committee that uh, were able to come here, and certainly very understanding of the ones that were not, uh, but, but certainly took time to submit questions. I thought I might win the uh, the prize for coming furthest, but my friend Jamie Herrera Butler uh, once more showed me up. Uh, I think it's exceptional that you came with young children uh, to come for this hearing, and I, I think uh, all of you need to be commended. But I want to point out my my friend who came the furthest uh, for for what she did. Um, there's a lot of good information in this hearing, and I think it really shows the reason why we we need to be meeting as regularly as possible particularly on this issue. Uh, I want to uh, thank again both of you, but uh, Dr. Fried, and I, th this idea of uh, the, uh, a health defense fund, so to speak, comparable to OCO, I think is really bears considerable merit. Chairman and I have talked about uh, something like this, have talked about the accounts uh, that, that you would want to uh, have that uh, you know, we're not trying to open up the budget or crack the budget caps, but Look, the defense budget in uh, January 1, 1942, was a lot different than it was in December 1, 1941. I mean, you have an intervening event, a Pearl Harbor type event. You have to relook at uh, what you've planned and see if uh, what's necessary to go forward. And I think, uh, you know, honestly, spending billions to save trillions is a no-brainer to me. And I think that's where we're at. We can never go through what we've gone through uh, here before in terms of the disruption in the lives of of the American people and in terms of the catastrophic cost imposed on the, the, um, uh, the uh, federal treasury, this is really the classic, you know, stitch in time saves nine kind of argument here, and I think it, it's incontestable. Uh, I think it's also clear that this is not, uh, uh, and Dr. Fried and I have talked about this before, this is not a one-and-done supplemental type of problem. We're going to have to look at adjusting baselines going forward in light of the information that we have. Uh, and uh, not all those are in this committee. When I talked about this to uh, our chairman, we, of course, focused on the CDC, the NIH, the Strategic Stockpile, the Infectious Disease Fund. Uh, but as she quickly pointed out, uh, you know, the Food Inspection Network and the FDA, neither of which are under our direct jurisdiction, are also areas that you would want to look at and include. So it's uh, and I know I've talked to uh, to our ranking member about this and to our staff about looking across all the uh, the budget categories that might fit in and have some appropriate response to to, to be in a, a system like uh, Dr. Frieden recommended. Uh, I know too by just having this discussion, Madam Chair, it's already popped up on Politico, so it, it shows the virtue of being at work and doing your business. Uh, because I think it'll stimulate a discussion uh, uh, farther beyond here. Uh, and I think it's a very important discussion for us to have. We are going to be caught up, we should be caught up, and we are focused in dealing with the, the immediate problem, that the coronavirus. And I, I've been very proud of, of the Congress. Yeah, we, we have our differences of opinion, and uh, there's some, some uh, partisan elbows thrown here and there along the way, fair enough. Uh, but four supplementals in a row with essentially no partisan dissent, I think, um, uh, is a pretty good indication that uh, people are very, very serious about this and are anxious to work together on this uh, and can work together on this. But while we respond to the immediate, and we're going to be responding to it for some time, again, I think we ought to build on the work that this committee has been engaged in for a number of years in a bipartisan way, in a bicameral way, because it couldn't have happened without help from our good friends uh, on the, in the Senate, uh, and move toward, um, you know, some sort of more realistic uh, and systemic, systematic, I should say, uh, uh, program, and, and systemic changes to accommodate those. So again, we build up the kind of capability and sustain it over time that we're going to need. I think that's going to be the real judge, uh, uh, the real uh, test as to whether or not we've learned the lessons. Um, I'm not very, I'm very understanding, honestly, of people caught up in a crisis that we probably couldn't envision literally 16, 17 weeks ago. 
Uh, so, um, you know, there will be valuable lessons to learn. Um, uh, but, uh, again, uh, we've, we've not had a lot of time to deal with this, and so we're not going to get everything right. Where I would be more critical is if we lost the opportunity to make the basic changes we all know that we need to make and the basic investments that we need to make, and both of you have laid those out um, for us to consider uh, today. So, um, again, thank you, Madam Chair, for what I thought was a very thoughtful and productive hearing. Thank all of my colleagues. I thought every one of them had good and important points to make and questions to ask. And I look forward to, uh, to working with you, Madam Chair, and all our colleagues on this committee and the full Appropriations Committee uh, to uh, see that we, uh, we draw the lessons and, and make the investments the American people need us to make going forward so that uh, while we're going to deal with this, not just in the short term, but probably uh, as both Dr. Rivers and Dr. Frieden indicated in the intermediate term, this isn't going away uh, by the end of this year. Uh, it's not going away by the end of next year. It's going to be with us for a considerable time until we can uh, develop the therapeutics and the, uh, ultimately the vaccine to deal with it. But uh, it's taught us an important lesson that we ought to learn about uh, the biosphere in general in terms of the number of challenges. We've had quite a few uh, in the last few years, everything from SARS to Zika to MERS to Ebola and now this. Um, that ought to tell us this is just a fact of life we're going to have to deal with, and uh, we're going to have to deal with it more effectively than we had. And, and this hearing that uh, you engineered, Madam Chair, has made that very apparent, and I think it's very helpful to the Congress and beyond that to the American people. So with that, I thank you, and I yield back. Thank you very, very much. Um, I, I really, this was... Um, the thought process on this was that, especially with this subcommittee, that we are at the center of uh, the programming. The, the portfolio includes uh, so many of the issues uh, that we, we face uh, in, this, in this pandemic. And so I, I want to thank both of you for your willingness uh, to be here this morning. I don't know what kind of difficulty that was in, in your own concerns or your own changing your lives, but also your own concerns about your health and your safety. And a particular thank you uh, to my colleagues who have come from all over uh, to be here uh, uh, today. Um, and, um, uh, uh, you know, Jamie traveled the farthest here. So, uh, and that, right, I wish I could think about what, he's a bottle of hand sanitizer, Jamie. Uh, 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 <laughs> uh, but it's uh, uh, it's it's a testament to the to the interest, and every single member on the committee um, that we spoke with wanted uh, to be here, and for one reason or another, uh, uh, could not. And that's why, at the opening of my remarks, I talked about um, these conversations uh, are so critical to um, the health, the safety, and, and the economic health and safety of the country. And we ought to be discussing those now in real time as we are putting together um, the, uh, uh, the public policy, the commitment of, of uh, uh, serious resources, uh, which is what we are, what we are uh, doing and will continue to try to do since we are working uh, through now to think about where we go with the CARES 2 package. Um, a, a couple of the... Uh, you, you know, the things that we have talked about. I would just say, uh, I just say to my colleague, uh, Dr. Harris, I wrote down, you know, the education piece of this, very, very important. But then I watch the news and I see, um, I, I, I see the beaches and I see people who are bright people, smart people, and it doesn't make any, any difference. Um, and then I see, honestly, I, I see people in, in various places around the, the country storming the Bastille, if you will, storming into city hall, storming here and saying, you know, no, you know, that's not what we, this is not what we should be doing. As even with the education that's out there at the moment and with the, the scope of, of, of the number of cases, and with the scope of deaths. I mean, 
that in and of itself should make you pause to think about what your own um, uh, behavior ought to be uh, in, this, in this kind of a crisis. Um, what the issue, uh, I also said at the outset of my comments, is that I, that I, uh, that I was or I am angry. It, why? And, and you've, you, you've helped a lot here with, can we get our arms around the testing? and the federal government and its role as its role and laying that out for um, the states and that collaborative effort in, in taking on the responsibility. Because I see it at the federal level. There was a, um, after the N New Orleans uh, uh, with Katrina, uh, a writer whose name was Michael Ignatieff, he wrote a piece um, that it was when the levees broke. He spoke about government as, and citizens as there being a covenant. And that when you reach a place where the circumstances in your life or in your environment are, are overwhelming, where the challenges are so overwhelming that you cannot do something about it. That's the role of the federal government, to step in, to take charge, to make sure that we can build those bridges, those pillars that can allow for us to move forward. And, when, and he talked about when that levees broke, the covenant broke at that time. Well, I think we have a very similar situation here. The levees broke. And the federal government is not at the center of the determination of how we gain control and go forward. You all have written very substantial plans. We asked about plans. Is there a national plan, et cetera? Um, the roadmap to reopening lays out very specifically the kinds of things we ought to do with phase one, phase two, phase three, and fourth phase is how we rebuild. Dr. Frieden, you have laid out a roadmap of the agencies that can move us forward, where we go in a forward way. You know, there are going to be people looking backward. We want on this committee to look forward, the kinds of things that we can do to make sure that we can prevent this. But I am asking you again, I look at, box it in, test Isolate, find, and treat, and quarantine. This is a roadmap. And at the federal level, what we ought to be doing is speaking with one voice and giving simple directions to our states, to the agencies of our states, and most of all, to gain or to regain the confidence of the American people and letting them know that how difficult this road is. Because again, as I said earlier, they're looking for the truth, no matter how hard it is. That's what I have always found. If you tell people straight, give them the sense that while we do not have all the answers, we do have a focus and a direction forward to safeguard themselves, their families, their health, their loved ones, and to safeguard their economic future and their economic security for the future. So I can't thank you enough for doing this. And I want you, you've written it out, you've laid it out, we need to work very closely with you. You need to keep speaking about this with the kind of standing that you all have. We believe in doctors and researchers and scientists. We believe in data. That is the foundation on which we will need to build to regain control of this scourge which is what it is. 
So I know you're not afraid, but don't be afraid to speak out. You have people who will listen, want to work with you. Have you help us get to where we want to go? And with that, this hearing is concluded. Thank you very, very much.